Naveed Kansari says most people think Iran looks like this. The deserts and women covered up in veils and men covered up and looking like clerics. Naveed knows that if most people think about Iran at all, the images that come to mind are probably from the hostage crisis in 1979 or the violence of the Iranian revolution that led up to it. During the revolution, Naveed was 10 years old and living in Tehran. He remembers the hostages and the violence, but he also remembers how it all began. My grandfather took me out to the streets, and as we walked the streets, I f saw that sense of joy. I saw that sense of possibility, that sense of hope that uh, this country could change, change for good, for the better, for people who are on the streets. The Iranian revolution started as a popular uprising, people from all walks of life coming together to overthrow a corrupt Western-backed king. But then it changed. It turned violent. That hope kind of became a little bit darker and and violence was out on the streets and, 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 and the fighting took place. And my father, who was a doctor, would, would spend the nights uh, in the emergency ward attending to wounded civilians and soldiers. Eventually, Naveed's family left Iran for Canada. But throughout his life, whenever he tried to explain what it was like living in Iran during the revolution, to offer a more nuanced understanding of the country, he felt like he wasn't getting through. He wanted to humanize this monumental moment. And he came up with a kind of counterintuitive solution. A video game. I'm Christina Quinn, and this is Dot Future, a branded podcast from Microsoft and Gimlet Creative about making the future happen. Because the future doesn't just happen. It's the result of a series of choices that we're making right now. You can wait for the future to come to you, or you can engage with it and get ahead of the curve. Welcome to Dot Future. Today, we're talking about gaming. Four out of five American households have gaming devices, like a tablet, Xbox, or a PlayStation. And over half of adults in the U.S. play games. Half! Production-wise, we have come a long way since... The top-selling games today are hyper-realistic. They immerse players in war zones, put them on the run from zombies, and take them to the 30-yard line with 12 seconds left in the game. Last year, the gaming industry made roughly $90 billion in sales worldwide. That's more than double what movies made at the box office last year. And here's why that comparison to Hollywood is relevant. Because like with films, the most popular video games are huge. They have great graphics, popular characters, and the franchises keep getting repeated over and over again. I mean, you know how it's kind of crazy that we have like, how many Fast and Furious movies now? There are like, what, eight? Well, guess what? There are 11 games in the Halo family. Blockbuster games even follow a Hollywood-style release calendar, according to Larry Herb. He's kind of the public face of Xbox Live. If you're a gamer, you know him as Major Nelson. Maybe we've got a summer blockbuster, but we always have these huge releases, you know, in the holiday season at the end of the year. And it's noisy because the new Call of Duty is going to compete with the new Star Wars movie. Games like Call of Duty are what you call AAA games. AAA is an unofficial industry rating. It doesn't actually stand for anything. The running joke is it means the game took a lot of time, a lot of resources, and a lot of money. Even if you're not a gamer, you probably recognize the names of AAA gaming companies in their games. Nintendo with Super Mario, Microsoft with Halo, and Activision with Call of Duty. And just like blockbuster films, blockbuster games are plagued by some of the same problems. The storylines can be kind of stale and repetitive. There's a hero. Some stuff blows up. You have to fight something or survive some catastrophe. And what that hero looks like is also repetitive. AAA games are as thin on diversity as they are on plot. There's a really popular gaming writer named Lee Alexander. Last year, she wrote all about this in a notorious blog post called Gamers Are Over. She wrote about how the AAA gaming culture can be summed up like this. Quote, have money, have women, get a gun, and then a bigger gun. She was done with it. And she argued that even developers want games to be made for and by a more diverse group of people to reflect real stories and real human struggle. And that's what today's episode is about. 
it's the part of the gaming industry that's providing an alternative to AAA games. We're talking about the Moonlights and the Napoleon Dynamites, the indie games that are breaking out, changing paradigms, and making a case for independence in gaming. And in the process, changing that $90 billion gaming industry from the inside. So back to the video game we mentioned at the beginning. Navid Kansari wanted to create a game to provide a more nuanced perspective. You know, you take a look at a lot of the Call of Duties and a lot of the uh, war games that are out there. It's always like, well, you're on the beaches of Normandy, but you're playing a member of the, you know, the U.S. Army and you're shooting at Germans. But that's really where the history stops. Navid made 1979 Revolution Black Friday. It's the story of the Iranian Revolution, told with the nuance that he didn't see portrayed elsewhere. <clears throat> if you're listening to this, then it means you received my package. And it's an indie game. It's heavy on story. 1979 puts you, the player, in the middle of Tehran during the Iranian Revolution and presents you with a series of options at every turn. Shots are fired. Where do you go? Who do you save? You were one of us. We fought side by side to overthrow the Shah, that Western puppet. What changed? Critics loved the game. It's an unmistakable indie darling. It racked up a bunch of awards, like Best PC and or Console Game at the 16-Bit Awards. This is a huge success for an indie game developer, but that's not what Naveed was for much of his career. He started out as the cinematic director at Rockstar Games, which makes Grand Theft Auto and Max Payne. He worked on some of the most profitable games in history. But eventually, all of the drug deals and shootouts and car crashes got old. He wanted to make something more real. To do that, Naveed quit his job at Rockstar Games and set out on his own to make a game about his real-life experience. He and his wife, who's a documentary filmmaker and anthropologist, founded a studio together. They called it Ink Stories. It's based in Brooklyn. Their work is inspired by Cinema Verite, a raw, intimate style of documentary filmmaking. So Naveed calls what Ink Stories makes Verite Games. 1979 blends real history and the game's action with real-life photographs and archival footage. The game has got me splattered all over it. Um, when you're in the home looking at the home movies... That's actually Super 8 footage that my grandfather shot from 1950 to 1979. And it includes my mother swimming at the Caspian Sea, um, my grand great-grandfather and family at a big feast, um, and myself attending uh, my first day of school. But Naveed wanted to make sure that the game was not just a glimpse into his own past. He wanted it to be accurate, more accurate, than the books he'd read or the films he'd seen about Iran's revolution. So he and a small team conducted more than 40 interviews with people who were living in Iran during the revolution. He also hired academics and religious advisors to ensure that the game was authentic. The end result is a subtle portrayal of a critical moment in history. When did you lose your faith? Instead of helping the new regime, you masterminded horrendous acts of violence against us. Are you ready for your redemption? So do you think that there are some stories better told through the immersive video game experience than through other mediums? Yeah, these are incredible tools to put you right in that space, to put you in the headspace or in that environment or in that uh, particular instant uh, where something is taking place. These are probably the most powerful way of creating empathy so in a weird way, if we want to actually understand a little bit more about humanity and really feel what it's like, we actually have to engage with some kind of technology that allows us to go there. Naveed is part of a new class of game developers who are intent on making games that are both personal and fun. It's a mission that, in the hands of AAA gaming companies, often fails. You can see a game that's made by, you know, people who look like me, so middle-aged white guys, and those, those games often don't have anything to say. Rick Eberhardt works at MIT's Game Lab, which experiments with new game technology. When they do try to say something, they're, not, they're, they're trying to adopt somebody else's language, and it feels wrong. He says indie games are coming from a genuine place, and that comes across in the experience of playing the game. 
And with an indie game, yeah, you can absolutely see like the person who made it, where what where they came from, what they brought to the game, what culture they're from. Culture and story haven't necessarily been a major focal point of video games. From the very beginning of gaming, the focus has been on graphics and speed. In 1977, Atari released what would become known as the Atari 2600. By 1980, millions of homes were introduced to the idea of playing games not at an arcade, but in your living room. But Atari didn't stay on top for long. In 1985, Nintendo released its entertainment system. The package came with a controller and a gun for playing Duck Hunt. Then in 1989, Nintendo leveled up gaming when it released a handheld console, the Game Boy. For millions of people, being able to take your games with you was totally novel, and it changed the gaming industry and family road trips forever. In 2002, Microsoft introduced Xbox Live, allowing console players to play with other gamers throughout the world, something they still do today, of course. Whether I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning because I can't sleep, I can pop on my console and all of a sudden I'm playing with friends that may or may not be on it, or I'm going to discover new friends. This is Larry Herb, or Major Nelson, from Xbox again. He's been at the company for 14 years, and for a million Twitter followers, he's the go-to guy for all things Xbox. Here's the thing about Xbox Live. A player in Philadelphia can connect with a player in the Philippines. There's always someone to play with. So if you have a young one, or maybe the baby's taking a nap, you can still go online, and within 30 seconds be connected with friends around the world. You're playing an interactive game, Games are just everywhere. They're on your phone, they're in the back of your airplane seat, you can get virtual reality gear at GameStop. And everything looks and sounds flawless. They're stunning, right? Yeah, they're amazing to look at. Mia Consalvo is the Canada Research Chair in Game Studies and Design at Concordia University. I think that expectations are being ratcheted up just kind of across the board. I mean, even, for example, let's say with sports games, like a Madden or, you know, like a baseball game where you would think that the game is just about playing football. But really, in those games now, I mean, they need photorealism. You know, they need the actual uh, images of the players. They have a role-playing system where you can create your own character. You can create you to be in the game, you know, and be recruited and work your way up from the minors to the majors. That's because games are in a fierce competition for our attention, according to Larry Herb. Our, our hours in the day that you and I and the, and the listeners have for entertainment, how are you going to spend them? There's just so much product out there right now that people have trouble bursting through. And to compete at the blockbuster level, it takes a lot of money to stand out. Money that indie developers and publishers often don't have. But what they do have, according to Mia, is nerve and creativity. In a way, the stakes for indie game developers are actually lower because they don't have to play ball with the big guys. They can take risks and experiment with visual style or even get emotional with their games. That's what Sharita Halitu set out to do when, as a college student, she began working on the game Beyond Eyes. <laughs> the game's protagonist is a little girl named Ray. Ray is blind, and at the beginning of the game, she loses her cat, Nani. Beyond Eyes is a quest to help Ray find her missing pet. Sharita isn't blind, but she wanted to make Beyond Eyes to help people understand what it's like to feel adrift. When I was 10 years old, my, my father died. And it was a very, well, of course, a very horrible experience. But it also taught me a lot of things about life itself. She wanted to help people who felt lost see themselves in a video game. So why, why is the character blind? So for me, it's kind of a metaphor because my dad was the most important family member for me in my life. Like my whole world kind of, you know, revolved around that. So that being taken away um, was a huge loss. And that kind of, <laughs> that kind of made a, a visual um, translation there. As Ray wanders through the game, the edges of the screen are white, but slowly the path forward spreads out before her, like watercolors rushing to the edge of a page. Strokes of color swirl around the edges. I really like um, watercolors and inks. I like the idea of how 
things become um, when you you know you put watercolor on on paper it just kind of drifts out you know flows out like the idea of not being able to see and then touching something and everything flowing out like water paint it's so gentle and so beautiful the premise feels so different than other games you're just helping a little kid find her cat so in essence the story of beyond eyes it's about loss but also about overcoming Sharita's definitely an outlier in the gaming industry. She didn't grow up wanting to make games. In college, she took a game development course and realized that games gave her the ability to tell stories in a new way. Even her way of measuring the impact of the game isn't very gamery. She keeps a glass bottle on her desk in her office. And every time she gets an email from someone who says that the game moved them to tears, she pours a few drops of water into the bottle. In the first six months, the thing was like a half full or something. In the end, that was like a cup and a half or something, I think, that I got. Sharita's not typical, but she is successful. Beyond Eyes was featured at the E3 conference in 2015, the world's top gaming conference. She's now working on a new series of short games called Trails of Life. It's extremely rare for an indie developer to gain success on their first game. Usually it takes years of releasing games and slowly building an audience. And lots of those developers cut their teeth at AAA studios before launching a game of their own. Carla Zimonia knows that from personal experience. She spent seven years working as an animator on lots of games, like the Bioshock series and Zoo Tycoon. I ended up working on a zoo game. There were a lot of very repetitive tasks to do. Like you would have to animate a sitting position to standing position for every single animal in the game. And turns 30 degrees right, turns 90 degrees right. It ended up kind of feeling like a spreadsheet. Carla felt like a cog in the machine and decided to leave the AAA system. She and a friend got together to strike out on their own. They started a gaming studio called Fulbright. They decided to make their debut game feel just like a first-person shooter game. You know, the games where you see through the eyes of a character as they move through the world, but with one important distinction. No shooting. They call the game Gone Home. Residents are strongly urged to stay indoors and secure all windows and doors. Gone Home is set in a spooky Victorian house in the year 1995. It's raining, the phones are down, and there aren't any cell phones to call for help. A Gone Home is the story of a college student arriving home after a year abroad uh, to find that her family has moved into a new house and nobody is there when she gets there. She explores the house and finds out all about what her family has been doing in her absence. Although it sounds like a ghost could pop out at any moment, the game isn't scary. As a player, you search for clues, notes, and audio diaries to help piece together what happened to this family. An enormous part of the game is putting together pieces for yourself and learning about the characters in your own time and way. Characters that don't appear on screen, but whose personalities, dreams, and entire lives are slowly revealed as you play the game. And perhaps the most remarkable reveal is what the New York Times called the greatest video game love story ever told. Well, there's this girl. I think she's a senior. She's usually dressed kind of punk. But sometimes I see her in this, like, army uniform. And she's always drawing in this notebook, looking so intense. I had no idea how I would ever, like, have an excuse to talk to her. It's a love story about two young women, Although Fulbright didn't set out to be a voice for LGBTQ people in the game world, Gone Home wound up getting a lot of attention. Because there aren't that many queer characters in big video games. AAA publishers tend to be pretty risk-averse when it comes to storytelling. Carla says when AAAs see a pitch that deviates from the norm, they're not likely to go for it. You know, the marketing guys at whatever big publishing company would have been like, excuse me, no one's going to buy that. It's, it's a couple of teen lesbians and you're on crack. By funding Gone Home themselves, Fulbright was able to make the game a reality and a smashing success. The gaming website Polygon named it their Game of the Year, and it won the British Academy Games Award for Best Debut. But more importantly to Carla, 
is the opportunity for her game to influence other bigger gaming companies. Indie games are often the source of new paths and new like approaches to things. We have the low overhead whereas like the really big companies don't they can't they're like those you know big ocean liners that you can't turn carla's company sunk their savings in 18 months of work into gone home it's nice to have people think your ideas are worth something essentially like the big guys being like oh yeah that little guy had a great idea (laughs) i mean you know it's it's nice it kind of means they've arrived but even more powerfully it means that the stories like the one in gone home are worth telling Here's Katie Stone Perez, who works for Xbox at Microsoft. By giving all of these different people an opportunity to tell their story and to bring their voice to the table, it really ends up creating those moments where people do feel like it is representative of their story and their lives and their passions. Katie says it's the responsibility of the gaming industry to make sure that the community feels seen and heard by having more diversity within games. That's why Katie joined Microsoft's ID at Xbox team and helped it grow. ID at Xbox gives indie game developers the tools they need to bring their games to life on the Xbox platform, and they promote their favorites at major industry events. Traditionally, the industry has been more, oh, do you know the right person to talk to? Um, And do you know the right person to go get funding from? And do you know the right person to do this? And um, and so we've really been about, you know, democratizing that process for everyone. One of the developers who's benefited from the democratization... Naveed Kansari, with his depiction of Iran in 1979 Revolution Black Friday. The game's success has helped rewrite how people see Iranians and how Iranians see themselves. For the first time, they see themselves portrayed as protagonists in a positive light rather than terrorists number one, two, and three. Naveed says his game is helping people see one another, like really understand each other. This is powerful. For us, that's been really, really, really enriching. And we made, look, we made a a lot of mistakes and it was our first game uh, that we've made, but at least we know that we overcame the most difficult part, which was connecting. And all it took to connect, to make a moment in history more human, was a video game. Dot Future is a co-production of Microsoft Story Labs and Gimlet Creative. We were produced this week by Caitlin Boguki, with help from Victoria Barner, Garrett Crow, Francis Harlow, Jorge Estrada, Nicole Wong, Abby Ruzica, and Julia Batero. Creative direction from Nazanin Rafsanjani. Production assistance from Tom Cody. We were edited by Rachel Ward and mixed by Zach Schmidt. Our theme song was composed by The Album Leaf. Additional music from Waltho, Elliot Lip, and Marmoset. Special thanks to Derek Johnson, Aaliyah Kiley, and Lena Robinson. Coming up next time on Dot Future, stories of how people on four continents are using one of the most popular games in history to heal, grieve, rebuild, and reinvent. I can't really even begin to describe how much Minecraft has changed my trajectory and where I was going. It's hard to even see back to where I was going because I'm so far from that starting point. That's next time on Dot Future. If you like Dot Future, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to type period future to find us, like period as in a dot dot future. And while you're at it, leave us a review so we know how you feel about the show. Don't get left in the past. Join us in the dot future or at dot future dot net. That's dot future dot net. I'm Christina Quinn. Thanks so much for dot listening.